Well, praise the Lord. We're going to speak on Blessed Are the Peacemakers today. We're in a series on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. The Bible says, The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called the sons of God. See, the Bible begins with this harmonious garden setting in which everything is in perfect peace right there in the Garden of Eden. But our parents sinned, and this peace that existed upon the earth was broken. And then God prophesies in Genesis 3.15. He says this, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That seed is singular, speaking of Jesus Christ coming and dealing with what broke the peace. He would come and deal with both sin and Satan. Sin and Satan robbed the peace that we could have. And God promises that in Christ, he was going to send a Messiah, a Savior, to deal with that problem. So in the work of Jesus and in his gospel, there is a power to restore peace to humanity. This is important because the world system that's under Satan's control does not have the power to restore lasting peace. There can be a, a sort of a temporary peace that the world can establish but without the true gospel, there can be no real and lasting peace. You can have international conferences between countries. You can have the United Nations. You can have sit-ins and love-ins and peace rallies and hunger strikes and all these huge protests that people have. But none of these things have the power to produce a lasting form of peace. All of these things are impotent without the gospel. You have to have the gospel. You have to have the message of what Jesus Christ did on the cross or else it's ultimately going to fail. You know, there's more depression, more mental and emotional sickness, more sexual confusion in our world than ever before. And if you look at the culture in the world system, it is filled with chaos and confusion. And so you say, why? Why is there so much chaos and confusion? The main reason there's a lack of peace in the world is very simple. It's because of sin. The Bible says this, Isaiah chapter 57, verses 20 and 21. The wicked are like the storm-tossed sea, for it cannot be still, and its waters turn up mire and muck. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. So no conference, no psychological training, no, none of this political stuff. We just need more education. That's the answer to everything. We just need more education. None of those things can solve the pro problems that only the gospel can solve. The Bible says this in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. I've got uh, two translations. The heart, is more de uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can un understand it? The next one. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? See, humanity does not have an education or economic problem as much as it has a heart problem. Humanity wants to call it economics or they want to call it, you know, we need more education. The problem and the reason there is so much chaos and conflict, the problem is our hearts. And when our hearts have not been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and the work of His Spirit, our hearts are wicked and deceitful. See, if the source of a river's problem is upstream, you don't fix it by treating it with chemicals downstream. You know, this is, you know, it might help the people that live downstream a little bit, but if the problem is upstream, you don't treat the problem downstream. You have to go to the source of the problem. And you can name all the problems we face as a society, whether it's division or racism or poverty or wars or sexual perversion. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, whether it's our government or other governments or other agencies around the world, almost everyone is managing symptoms. They're not going to the heart of the problem. All of the billions and trillions of dollars that now uh, President Biden will try to go out there and throw at a situation, he is simply managing 
symptoms. It is not treating the problem. You know, almost all of these institutions that we supposedly trust in, either they're secular, which means they're trying to do it without Christ, or they're outright anti-Christ. And I would actually, I don't think it's a newsflash, our government is actually now operating anti-Christ. When our government strips all the regulations against abortion and promotes perversion of every kind and requires countries to, you know, have abortions and have certain LGB policies or whatever in order to get funding. Not only have they gone from basically being secular, trying to do it without Christ, they're actually promoting an anti-Christ agenda right now. And, and, and so how, how can we expect our government really to solve any problem? Our government is actually the problem right now. Our government is largely the source of our problems. Because truly, only the kingdom of God and only the gospel possess the power to bring true and lasting peace into this world. You know, when you're a kid, you know, and you're going to college and, you know, you think you get educated and you start to become a little pragmatic. You start to say, I see, you know, a little bit of the reasoning of the world and and the wisdom of the world. But once you see it fail over and over and over and over again, you know, those guys those that were sitting in front of you on the pulpit, that you think this is just too simple, this is just too religious. That he was going, Jesus is the only answer. Now after 54 years of living on this earth, I realize Jesus really is the only answer. Whatever the government can do, it's only going to be temporary. The things of God's kingdom, those are the things that are eternal and last. You know, I say all this because true and lasting peace... Our scripture, the peacemakers are blessed, can only come when men's hearts are changed and when sin is dealt with. You can win an argument all day long or think you win an argument and you don't win a person's heart. You didn't win anything. You may have, you may have pushed you know, uh, a little bit of the boundaries down the road a little bit or whatever. You may have thought, th- thought you won an argument, but if you didn't win their heart, you really didn't win anything. You just pushed things down the road a little bit. It's, it's only through the gospel that true peace can come. So I said all of this because any discussion with what a peacemaker is has to start with who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. This is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. Everything was created by Jesus in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. And I'm putting Jesus in there because it's Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and by Jesus all things hold together. Jesus is also the head of the body of the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that Jesus might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The Bible says, once you are alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy and faultless and blameless before him. If you indeed remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. So the path of any peace can only come with the Prince of Peace. You know, sin is what separates us from God. And this separation from God is the main reason people have a lack of peace. And you've probably seen some of the church signs. It says, N-O Jesus, then N-O peace, and then K-N-O Jesus, K-N-O peace. If you don't have Jesus, you can't have true peace. But if you really have Jesus, you can't have peace in your heart. So it is through Jesus and his cross that he has made it possible for us to have peace with God. That's where it all starts. That's where peace starts being reconciled with God. Now, this Greek word for reconciliation here has the basic meaning of change. 
or exchange. And I'm speaking of reconciling with God, being at peace with God. Reconciliation is necessary when you have a breakdown in a relationship between two people, and and it also exists between God and people. So the, the basic meaning, reconciliation means change, is a change occurs in the relationship where it goes from a state of hostility or brokenness to one of harmony and peace. That's what reconciliation is when there's a restoration of fellowship. It was broken, but now it's put back together again. That's what it means to be reconciled. And what happens is one person will reach out to do something to make it possible for reconciliation to take place. And so one person has the initiative. And and a lot of times it's to offer forgiveness or to do whatever it takes to fix the problem. But God so loved the whole world, right? But is the whole world saved? No. For reconciliation to occur, the other person has to respond and accept what is offered. We can say to her blue in the face, Jesus died for everyone, and, and you know, that means in God's will is that everyone is saved, and so everybody's going to be saved, but that's not the truth. People have to receive what God offers to them, and it's an expression of their heart. Whether they truly love God or not, are they going to receive the forgiveness that he offers? See, it's, it's, it, this is uh, part of the context of what we're looking at here. This is what... God has done for us in Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're talking about peace in the context of, of, of reconciliation. The Bible says this in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we place our faith in Jesus Christ. First thing it says is we have peace with God. We've also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And here, here's, here's where we were. It's, the Bible says while we were still helpless... At the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. That ungodly is us. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, that's us, before we accepted Jesus, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? And not only that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We now have received this reconciliation through him. See, everything Jesus did was so that we could be reconciled back to God. But we have to accept the offer. And if we accept the offer, offer, it says here in Romans 5.1, Since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. So God offers us peace through the sacrifice of his son. So look at today's verse again. It says, the peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called the sons of God. What is this saying? In a primary sense, you have to teach the primary meaning of something, and then there's secondary meanings. The primary meaning is... Those who participate in peacemaking will be called the sons of God. Or those who participate in helping people find peace with God, they will be called the children of God. Often, when a child looks like their parent, acts like their parent, has the character of their parent, and all that stuff, and in my case, if they're doing something bad, you know, Melissa might say, well, you know, he's behaving just like you or whatever. But, but nonetheless, whenever a, a kid just, you can say, that's, 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 you know, that's uh, your child or that's that person's child because of the way they behave or the way they look, we will say something like, they're just a chip off the old block or the nut doesn't fall far from the tree and all that kind of stuff. And basically what we're saying is we look at that child and we say they're just like their parents. Well, that's what this verse is actually saying. 
That's what this verse is saying here. God our Father undertook it Himself to do everything that was needed for us to be able to be reconciled with Him and have peace with Him. So when we, as God's children, take up the same ministry of reconciliation and begin to show others how they can have peace with God, then what happens is we've entered into the family business and we're carrying on the work of our Father and we're carrying on the work that our older brother Jesus Christ started. Do you see that? It's, it told us that God Himself was reaching out to us for us to be reconciled to Him, and He did it through the work of Jesus Christ. And so this is, in a sense, it's like the family business. God wants people reconciled to Him, and when we enter into that same spirit of reaching out to people to speak to them the gospel that they might have peace with God and be reconciled with God... It's like we come into the family business and God is saying, you know what, you're my children. You're doing exactly what, what's in my heart and what Jesus Christ set out to do. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. The Bible says this, From now on then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now we no longer know Him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And here it is. And He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ and certain that God is appealing through us. That means God is speaking through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He who made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. God's like, yep, that's my son. That's my daughter. They're carrying on the family business. They're showing other people how to have peace with me. That is the main meaning of this verse. When we set out to declare the gospel and to show people how they can have peace with God, we look we're looking and acting like the children of God. But again, this goes beyond just leading people to Christ because the spirit of peacemaking should really touch all of our relationships. So it should flow into the rest of our life. Just like we say we love our Lord our God with our heart, with our soul, with all our strength, it flows into naturally loving your neighbor as yourself. So in the same spirit of being a peacemaker, primarily in the sense of we are showing people how to have peace with God, it should flow into our everyday relationships. We should be quick to apologize to people. We should be quick to try to resolve conflict. We should refuse to respond in anger or try to get revenge. We should always do our part to be at peace with others. This is what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. The Bible says this, If possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Now, I've said this before. The Beatitudes, they're sort of uh, expanded upon in the Sermon on the Mount and then later on in the book of Matthew. These Beatitudes are kind of like the core teaching and then they get expanded. So if you go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Jesus is expanding on this. He says, if you're offering your gift on the altar and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on your way with him or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will not, never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. So he's saying we should be quick to be reconciled with each other. But he goes further in verse 43, Matthew 5, 43. He says, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, 
so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And he goes on to say, he causes the sun to rise on the good and in, on the evil. This is exactly what we were reading about in Romans chapter 5. While we were yet enemies of God, Jesus Christ died for us. See, grace raises the standard. Somehow this world, in a way that I cannot understand, believes that now that we're under grace, we're able to live any way we want. But if you read the Bible with an open mind, you recognize because we now have the Holy Spirit in us, the standard actually goes higher. You know, it, it, he says, you know, not only do you need to be reconciled to your brother, he says, as a matter of fact, I want you to pray for your enemies. Grace always raises the standard. But right here where it says, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the sons of God. It says it right here. When you pray for your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So this spirit of peacemaking, when we first tell others how to have peace with God, and then we try to the best of our ability to have peace with each other and peace with our enemies, God says, that's what my children look like. That's what a son or daughter of God looks like. And I'm not going to go there, but even in Matthew chapter 18, he speaks on restoration and forgiveness. So this is the spirit of what is being talked about here in the peacemakers are blessed for they will be called the sons of God. But a few more points and then we'll close. First is we're never to pursue peace at any cost. Never pursue peace at all cost because sometimes it's just not possible to have peace. Sometimes it's just not. I don't, because I, I, I don't like to preach a message and then just think, okay, I got, I got to go have peace with everything and everybody because sometimes it's not possible. And sometimes, actually, the pursuit of peace will bring you into conflict. Pursuing peace will actually do the opposite. It will bring you into conflict with someone else. Now, we are, we are not called... In this sense, I want you to just kind of understand peacemaking. It's really actually hard business. We're not to have silly smiles. We're not to be making peace signs. This is not some, you know, uh, glazed over, happy look. We're just going peace, peace, you know, peace. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just be at peace. You know, we're not called upon to be doormats. We're not, we're not called to just let people get away with things that are wrong. We're not called to just say, you know, don't say anything because we want peace. That is absolutely not the spirit of peace in Scripture. Now, according to A.W. Pink, wherever righteousness and peace are mentioned together in the Bible, righteousness always precedes peace. If you think about that logically, there can be no real peace if it's an immoral situation. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 37, I mean 32, excuse me, verse 17. The result of righteousness or godliness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. I think I gave two versions of it. If, if it is, that's fine. That's, that's good enough. The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. See, righteousness is walking in holiness and according to the standards of God and doing things that are accepted with God. So as believers, if we like, apply this to ourself, we cannot walk in unrighteousness and expect to have peace. So you can just state it. If, you walk, if you're walking, however it applies to your life, you're walking in an area of sin or unrighteousness, you're not trying to walk according to the standards of God's Word, you will not have the complete peace that God promises you can have because you cannot have true peace by walking in unrighteousness. And it's the same for truth. You cannot walk in lies or hypocrisy and expect to have the fruit of peace in your life. If you're doing something you know is false or, or untrue, if you're living in hypocrisy, you cannot have peace. True peace will never come from a compromise situation. That's the point I'm trying to get. Where there's righteousness or truth, where if it's compromising truth or righteousness for peace, it won't last. So that's in our life, and it's the same in our relationship. No true peace can be maintained if it's built on a compromise. And I think a lot of times people try to have peace by capitulating and saying, you know what, I'll just let them get away with it because it's not worth fussing over, fighting over because we're just going to have you know, conflict. It's not worth, don't say it to them. Just don't say it. 
Don't say it to them because it's going to... And I know there are situations, this is a nuanced thing, where sometimes it's, it's better to kind of hold your tongue for a while. But if you have a child or a relationship and the peace is built on a compromise or falsehood, you might as well give it up. You might as well give it up because true peace cannot come without righteousness and truth. So if you have to overlook sin or give in to sin or make some compromise with truth or integrity in order to have peace in a relationship, then it's going to ultimately fail anyway. You might as well do yourself and them, them a service and go ahead and tell the truth from the beginning. And if it's going to blow up, just let it blow up at that point. Look at Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But he knew that there was going to be strife and conflict before peace would come. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And we've let our culture sometimes, in a, in, a, in a sort of progressive way, paint Jesus in a very sort of soft, tender, you know, almost kind of like, you know, sort of like a, a hippie doing the peace sign, you know, everything's good. But Jesus flipped tables and he went to the leadership, he went to the government. He went to the Pharisees and he rebuked their hypocrisy. You know, sometimes the path of peace is made by swinging a double-edged sword of truth and righteousness. We have to swing, it has to be in love. We can never be arrogant or mean or vengeful. But sometimes evil has to be confronted and destroyed before true peace can take place. So I'm trying to put a balance on the teaching, okay? We are to seek peace. And we're to use a lot of discretion whenever we're around people. We have unsaved relatives. Maybe your cousin is a lesbian or something. You know, the first thing you do is not to go in there and open up the Bible and tell them they're going to hell. You know, you're supposed to reach out to people and you're supposed to love people, but you're also supposed to pray for an opening and an opportunity, you know, to witness to them in love. How, how, how loving is this? If you knew somebody was going to walk out in front of a train... And the only thing, they were so far away, the only way to stop them was to scream at them. But you were afraid they'd get their feelings hurt if you raised your voice. That's kind of stupid, right? Well, sometimes people are about to bust hell wide open. But we are more concerned about their feelings in the moment than the truth that's going to set them free. So we balance this teaching with a little bit of discernment. The Holy Spirit will lead us. Christ has called us to be peacemakers but not peacemaking at any cost. So the bottom line, and I'm, I'm done, we are in the main role of peacemaking when we declare the gospel. That is really the main thing that we have been called to do. Number two, we're also called to live out the truth of... Can you put up Romans 12, 18? The Bible says this, as it is possible on your part live at peace with everyone. To the best of our abilities, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are. Even the, the, you know, the, the, even the nastiest person, the meanest person we know, we can't, we can't be reciprocal in that relationship. If they're mean, that doesn't give us permission to be mean. To the best of our ability, we should try to have peace with everyone. But... The very pursuit of peace may sometimes bring us into conflict. This is the rest of the Beatitudes, and maybe next week or the week after I'll be speaking. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. I mean, you know, this is at the end. I mean, you know, somebody is, a, you know, they're poor in spirit and they, they mourn over their sin and they're, they're meek. They yield themselves to God. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. They show mercy to people. They have a pure heart. They're peacemakers. And all of a sudden it says, those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, the irony here is you may be mocked and ridiculed and persecuted for preaching a message that would bring someone peace. You may be mocked and ridiculed and persecuted by the very person that you're speaking to to show them how to have peace with God. Nonetheless, the Bible tells us 
we continue to proclaim Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. We seek to live at peace with all men. We never compromise the truth. We never compromise morality. And we understand that this is what it looks like to be a true son or daughter of God. Pursuing peace. Pursuing peace. Pursuing peace the best we can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that by your spirit, your word comes alive. We know that we pursue peace and reconciliation, Lord, by grace, that I can just preach a message. And we could just go on, or you could speak to our hearts and make application where this is real in my life, Lord, and it's real in our lives, where we have circumstances and situations, God, that you want us to press through, whether it's to witness to someone or to mend a broken relationship. We need the grace of your spirit, God, because we see this is where we look most like you when we're pursuing peace. So, Father, help us to apply this word today. We thank you for this truth, and we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.